Yeah, so obviously I attempted Dakota Johnson's most iconic look from the 2018 Suspiria remake. I don't know if I'm living for it, but like I kind of am. Also, if this stains my face, um, I'm gonna start a riot, so keep an eye on the news. If you're new here, welcome. If you're not new, welcome back. This is a series I've been doing on my channel for almost a year now where I talk about original classics versus their contemporary remakes. And I don't think that I've ever covered a horror fantasy movie in this series or even on my channel before. This is a highly intriguing topic to me. I love witches as well. And this is my favorite series that I do on my channel. So very excited for today's video. I've also never covered a giallo style slasher before. So all good things. Grab a drink, grab a snack, grab a smoke smoke if you fancy, and let's dive right into my comparison of Suspiria. Also, if you haven't seen one of these videos in this series before, this is the structure that I follow. First, I'm gonna get into all the behind the scenes information, and today I've done an absurd amount of research. I found a documentary on Argento's career, I found behind the scenes footage, and interviews, and interviews, and interviews. So many interviews, I feel like I've seen the insides of everybody's brain, and now I'm ready to present to you the guts. Next, we'll go over plot comparison. How did the remake reimagine the original story. After that, we'll compare our lead characters. So who is our favorite final girl? Who's our favorite villain? Next up will be the style, and both of these movies are dripping in style, so that'll be a big portion of this video. Lastly, we'll go through a thematic breakdown of either movie. What were we meant to learn or walk away with from these movies? And the little cherry on top that I throw on at the end is where I decide which is the superior film. But before we can get there, there is a lot to go through, so let's kick it off with all the background info on the original Suspiria. As most of you know, this was released in 1977 and was directed by Dario Argento. A little bit about Argento, his mother was a famous photographer and his father was a well-known movie producer. His father also produced most of his early work, including Suspiria, and oh, to be a nepotism baby. Another movie that his father produced for him that you might know is Deep Red from 1976, which is another giallo-style horror thriller. An interesting historical tidbit about this movie is that it's where Argento met his long-term partner, Part no. My mouth wants to make it rhyme so bad. He met his long-term partner, Daria Nicolodi. And every time I say her name, I just want to do the like Nickelodeon. Which if I may, if my name was Dario, I don't think you'd ever catch me dating a woman named Daria. Daria and Dario fall in love. It sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. Alas, they fell in love anyways. According to their child, Asia Argento, they fell madly in love and she essentially became his muse. And without her, we wouldn't have gotten Suspiria. She's actually a co writer on the film. She has a small role in Suspiria as well and shows up in a plethora of Argento's work. But how did our leading star Jessica Harper make her way into this movie? She actually didn't have to try very hard. My agent said, you know, there's this weird movie. <laughs> so I, w I went to the William Morris office and met with Dario. I didn't have to audition, I just had to sit in a room with him and pretend to understand Italian for... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, her agent got her a meeting with Argento and she didn't even have to audition. She'd also worked with Brian De Palma around the same time, so just two huge directors. She said that Argento focused more on the light and color while De Palma was much more obsessed with the camera movement. She was also asked about the reception of the movie from the time it was released up until now. The consensus seems to be that it's grown substantially since it was first released. However, some major icons were interviewed for the documentary on Argento's life and you might be surprised to see who has a high praise for Suspiria. For example, here is John Carpenter on Suspiria. Suspiria is the all-time, one of the all-time great horror movies ever made. It's terrifying. It's like a it's like a bad dream. It's like a nightmare. It's like being trapped in a nightmare. Not only Carpenter, but music legend Alice Cooper has some thoughts as well. I put Suspiria in my top three best horror movies of all time. I think Suspiria has got an attitude and a feel and a sound to it that is a true nightmare. Pretty cool stuff. Would definitely love to have some industry legends loving on my work someday. But in the movie database and on Google, I couldn't find any information about the budget of the original movie. But according to the movie database, this movie made almost $3 million in the box office. And if you adjust that for current inflation, it's about 14 million in today's world. That's decent considering horror was definitely not a popular genre at the time. And I know I might hear some pushback on that, but I'm talking relatively, like just in terms of cinema. So it's certainly come a long way since then. Not to mention how many other directors since then have pulled inspiration from Argento. I think that Dario can influence people and has influenced directors with his absolute courage 
at what he can do on the screen. He had so much impact on aspiring filmmakers, in fact, that in 2018, a remake was released, directed by Luca Guadagnino. Luca was apparently obsessed with Suspiria from the age of 14 and even borderline stalked Dario Argento in his childhood. I remember I was a kid that went to Rome because I had to do some, I, was, I come from Palermo, Sicily, and I begged a friend of my mom to drive me all the way to Viale Mazzini, which is almost like Santa Monica Boulevard, to go up and down and find on all the doors the name Dario Argento because I knew he was living there. <laughs> Tilda Swinton was another person that was very much obsessed with Suspiria as long as she could remember. And after she and Luca met almost 30 years ago at this point, they immediately shared their love of the original film. So they had been planning to do this remake for over 20 years before they actually made it happen. Another reason why Tilda wanted to make this movie is because she feels that in her career she is constantly trying to do things that people have never done before. And I was interested to hear that because that's exactly how I approach my work. With my short Somnum, for example, I was so determined to give that one my all because I'd never seen any mainstream horror movies about sleep paralysis, which is insane because it's one of the most terrifying things that humans can experience in real life. So that makes me happy to hear, especially because the talent of this woman cannot be understated. So the fact that she lends her talent to pushing boundaries and doing new weird stuff all the time, I love that. This movie also starts stars Dakota Johnson, Chloe Grace Moretz, and Mia Goth. Mia's interview was also pretty enlightening as far as Luca's directing style. He loves actors, you get that sense of him immediately, like he has a real respect for what we do. He trusts his actors with all of his heart. It's a real collaborative effort. That's something that I also love to hear as well when directors make it a very collaborative process with their actors and don't treat them just as meat puppets. Mia Goth and Dakota Johnson also talked a fair amount about how they trained to do all the dancing scenes. They trained for six to eight hours a day for sometimes seven days a week for two months before they started shooting. And I think it shows the dancing in this movie is phenomenal, but we'll break that down more in the style portion of the video. Lastly, for the background info, this movie was not as much of a success as its predecessor. It had a budget of $20 million and then it only went on to make $7.7 .7 million in the theaters. And then I have no idea what kind of residuals it made from Amazon Prime, but that's no good. That's a real stink bomb of a release. And I'm honestly not too surprised to hear that. And this is a good segue because sometimes I like to let you guys know my opinions on films before I get into like the meaty portion of the video, just so you know any biases that I have. Because even in my academic level video essay, there's gonna be some bias. I've never been super big on Suspiria, but upon my rewatch of the original, I actually enjoyed it a lot more. And that's a fun movie. I think I'll revisit it plenty of times in my life. I said that I wasn't surprised about the remake being a box office bomb because that movie was not for me. Sure wasn't. And I have no problem being objective about what the film did really well, but as a whole, I just didn't like the movie and I am frankly so upset about that. It should have been right up my alley, but alas, here we are. So now that you're aware of some of my bias, I that we get into our plot breakdown in comparison. In the original Suspiria, Susie is an American dancer who comes to live at a ballet academy in Germany. Women from the company end up dead or missing until the crescendo of the film in which Susie exposes the witches who run the company. In a fiery finale, Susie manages to barely escape. In the 2018 remake, Susie is an American dancer who moves to Berlin to audition for a dance company. She quickly rises to be the new lead dancer while her friend in the company, Sarah, suffers through her discovery that they are being led by witches. In a far more bloody crescendo, Susie is revealed to be a witch herself and intends to take her place as the new leader of the dancing coven. Plot-wise, there's way too much to get into with the remake that I'm not even gonna touch, but if we look at the material, the original movie is less than an hour and 40 minutes long, while the remake is over two and a half hours long. I'm not mad that they took the time to fill in some of the ambiguous gaps of the original, and the movie is completely unique in a lot of ways. It's like Tilda Swinton says, it's more of a cover than a remake, though when you break it down simply, the only real major difference is the ending. And then we also have this psychiatrist character who is also played by Tilda Swinton. But there's this running gag that she does where they tried to keep it under wraps that she was also playing this role. And so at this one panel that they did in Venice, she actually had this fully typed out letter. And it was from this supposed actor that actually likes to keep a very private life and didn't want to make an appearance and will probably never star in a movie again. And for Tilda, if you could comment on, on the two roles, why you decided to, to do this. <laughs> what two roles? <laughs> You're mad at Blonde. I think that Blonde is. Yes, and I, I assume that you 
played uh, Dr. Klemperer. As you will see from the credits and on all the posters, that Dr. Klemperer is played by Lutz Ebersdorf, <laughs> who sent a message that I read just now. <laughs> And it's a funny running bit, I have to admit. But on screen, as far as the character goes, I can't say I really see the purpose. I'm glad that they expanded upon the witch's motives a little bit, though never at any point while watching the original did I think that I needed their motives explained. But the parts that they filled out with this psychiatrist about, you know, Chloe Grace Moretz's character kind of going through a breakdown, I didn't need that. I didn't feel like that added anything to see the abuse that many of these women were suffering in the dance company. There is one really cool exception though. I think we can all agree that the scene where Susie is dancing and she's been imbued with power so she's completely contorting and breaking this other girl's body with her movements is insane. And I have some more fun facts about that scene when we get into our style comparison. That's the only exception though. I don't see any other way that the narrative was enhanced by having, you know, as I said, Chloe Grace Moretz's character going through this psychotic break. And for fuck's sake, I mean her character disappears for the entire midsection of the movie. By the time she shows up in the climax again, I'm like, Oh, I forgot you were here. Oh, Johnny, I apologize. I forgot you were there. In regards to the ending of the movie, though, in theory, I love it. In theory, I am obsessed with it. In execution, in actuality, it's so weird. What the hell is going on? I love the reveal that Susie is actually a witch herself and she's been aware of the magic surrounding her the entire time. However, when she comes to kind of, you know, set things right with the coven and get rid of the evil witches, she has this demonic entity doing her dirty work essentially and I'm like, what's the reason? Nothing is actually fleshed out plot-wise with that. And not in like a ooh, mysterious kind of way, but more of a what the actual f kind of way. It feels like Susie wants to belong and has a deep respect for this coven because of how much it seems she connects with Tilda Swinton's character, Madame Blanc. But then all of a sudden it's like, all of y'all are corrupt and I'm killing everyone that supports you, Marcos. Which by the way, who the hell? But anyways, it, it's fair enough because like, okay, yeah, they gutted Sarah. She was your friend, you know, for their ritual. But don't even get me started on the post credit scene, okay? Because what the hell is going on here on this day? Nothing was satisfying about the ending of the movie to me, and I also have a gripe with the six-act structure of the movie. What was the point besides making the epilogue the most boring shit that I've ever seen? There were no stylistic notes distinguishing each act. There were no major reveals or plot beats that made the act structure make sense to me. And it sucks because I was pretty into the first hour of the remake, and I enjoyed the intention of the change that they made at the end, but it was not executed well in my opinion, which I will gripe more about when we talk style. It was just far less satisfying than Susie literally crumbling the academy to the ground in a fiery blaze and then smiling as she finally makes it out the door. And that kind of pains me to say because generally I would obviously take the witch's side in most scenarios. But since we're already on the topic of the witches, let's move on to our character comparison. I'm not going to talk about most of the characters because there are really only two that are important to me. So let's start with our dance instructors. I want to compare Miss Tanner, played by Alita Valley from 1977, to Madame Blanc in 2018, played by Tilda Swinton. I think both ladies have their merits and they are my favorite character from each movie respectively. Miss Tanner is a little less complex because she plays a pretty standard hard-ass teacher. You know, the kind of coach that doesn't care what pain you're in because they think that pain makes you better or some dumb shit like that. I think that remake actually adapted that character the best and in fact is probably one of my favorite things that the remake did. And I know they're not technically the same character but they fill the same role in each movie so that's why I'm comparing them. Because Tilda's Madame Blanc still has has that hard ass energy to her, but she manages to express that energy in such a soft and kind way. And I've never really seen that kind of a mixture in a personality. Maybe I've just always had bad coaches. I don't know. <laughs> I was a volleyball player, was never really much of a dancer. But either the character or Tilda, they're kind of one and the same to me. She's just so assured. She captures the confidence of someone who's the ultimate master in her craft. And with acting, you could argue that she is, so maybe that wasn't that hard for her. But while she was persistent, she was also just such a kind teacher. And this made her death and the whole betrayal aspect of her character more interesting, but also a little bit more disappointing. But anyway, another interesting thing about the character is the way that Tilda Swinton saw her and kind of crafted the character. It was all about roots, and I imagined her as a tree, the iconic 
dress that she wears is like she's like a tree with mm. brown roots. I've never heard an actor describe their character as tree-like, that they remind them of a tree. I guess maybe because this teacher has her roots so deeply in dance, and then the design of her character was also kind of meant to reflect her steadiness. I think that's super cool. Another fun fact, this character was inspired by the real-life dance teacher Pina Bausch, and I have to say that I think that they totally nailed the look. Sturdy and controlled are are definitely words that I would use to describe Madame Blanc. And this look really puts it all together. Moving on to our protagonist, Susie, though, I do think that Jessica Harper had a much more natural performance. Don't get me wrong, because I think that what Dakota brought to her character was also pretty cool. And I can't fault her, really, for what I didn't like, because her awkward behavior was attributed to her growing up in an abusive Amish household. But I don't know if it's because of that, I just didn't find her relatable as, like, a human being at all. She acted like a little little soft-spoken fairy, a little fairy that just wanted to dance. The point is, I just didn't really sense an ounce of real human emotion from her character. Again, you could argue because, oh, she's secretly a witch. But because I didn't get that human vibe from her, I just didn't end up giving a single f about her character. The person that I latched onto was Mia Goth's character, Sarah. And the intention was for Sarah to kind of be the audience character and be the audience's eyes. But in that case, like, Susie's still our protagonist. She's still our lead, so whatever. But with Sarah, I don't feel like there is a strong enough equivalent of a character in the original. In fact, the original Susie is much closer to the remake version of Sarah. But that's about all I have for the characters. As I mentioned, these movies are very style-driven, so let's get into style. Now, there's not too much much to be said about the original that has not already been said countless times. It's a giallo slasher, and if that's a new term for you, then here it is. They usually blend the atmosphere and suspense of thriller action with elements of horror fiction and eroticism, and they often involve a mysterious killer whose identity is not revealed until the final act of the film. A lot of people also associate giallos as being very stylish and very colorful because that is what Argento brings to the table. This movie is dripping in primary colors, which was another thing noted by Jessica Harper. She also also noted that the Blu-ray release is the best in terms of color quality, so I really want to get my hands on that now, but if you're in the US, then you can watch this movie for free on Tubi. But yeah, tons of primary colors. The blood also has a very interesting look in this movie. It's very bright. I think it's gorgeous to look at, and it's a really interesting style choice, but it just kind of takes me out of the narrative aspect of the movie because it looks so fake. Suspiria is more about the visuals anyway. Two other style notes that I have to make, though, are on the production design and the score, both of which are just mint. For example, in one of the first death scenes, we get these great wide shots and the design of the interior is so disorienting. You definitely feel like you've been transported to a realm of witches, like they're not even trying to hide it. One of my absolute favorite sets though is this office space where Susie ends up discovering the secret layer of the head witch later on, which I'll talk about the look of the witches as well, don't worry. But it's gorgeous. Every time I watch this movie, I am always so impressed with the production design. And of course, the lighting. It's amazing, but I'm not gonna linger on that because I'm sure anyone who's ever reviewed this movie has gone, oh, and the lighting, it's just so good. Es obvio. My favorite stylistic choice of the original Suspiria, though, has to be the score because wow. I love the mixture of fairy tale wonder and skin crawling horror that mix together in this score. It starts with the very, you know, whimsical kind of plinky sounds like, wow, how mysterious and beautiful. And then those lower notes start hitting and you're like, mmm, mm, yep, that's making me uncomfortable. And then when the little la la la's come in, so creepy, so creepy. What an immaculate score. It just creates the strangest disconnect for me and makes me uncomfortable in the best way. And fun fact, they made the score before they ever even shot the movie, which is pretty unheard of, because typically they'll have a composer compose the score after the movie's been edited. But on set, they would blast the music, which helped the actors to get into the mood. And they were able to do this because they dubbed pretty much the entire movie. But for the most part, everything, everything was dubbed. But usually you'd be shooting and you know there's guys over there hammering building a set and people are singing songs in a tug you know there's all kinds of <laughs> stuff and because they didn't 
Yeah, I figured oh, we're going to dub it all anyway, so they didn't really protect what? the sound. They didn't use hardly any of the on-set audio, which you can definitely notice and is one thing that I do feel like holds the movie back a little bit, because if there's one thing about me, honey, I hate dubbing. We'll never watch an international film that's dubbed. No way. So you win some and you lose some with that choice because we probably did get better physical acting from these actors, but at the cost of getting usable audio on set. <laughs> Jessica Harper even said that sometimes while they'd be shooting, they'd be using loud power tools and stuff while building sets in another location nearby. That's insane to me because it goes against everything I've ever learned about sound in film. When I've been a PA on like a legitimate indie feature, one of my jobs was locking down the sets, which was the gruesome task of just standing outside of the set, like usually outside of a door, and just make sure that nobody wanders in and out during the duration of whatever they're shooting. And if you're on a really shitty production, they'll go, no sitting! So then you'll just be standing for four hours for legitimately no reason. I've also been a boom operator a couple of times, and you have to be hyper aware of like planes flying by, any other little noises that might sneak in. So to think of being on a production where while production is rolling, they are using power tools in the same vicinity makes me deeply uncomfortable. Sorry, that was such a long tangent. I'm gonna talk about the style of the remake. What struck me immediately about this movie was the camera work and particularly with the dancing sequences. I loved whenever we were in the academy, especially in the mirror room. Oh, Lucas said that his team really wanted to go for a full green screen CGI moment, but he insisted on using real mirrors and then they just digitally removed the camera and added one wall to cover up some unwanted windows. But there are some very sharp contrasts in style from the original to the remake. The original is very psychedelic feeling. It's very fluid. Things are so colorful and the edges are a lot more round. It's just very disorienting. Whereas in the remake, the set design is very sharp. Lots of very geometric square shapes. It's much more sturdy and Luca describes it as stern. And it's also much less colorful. It's very drab and it feels a lot more self-serious until you get to the ending, which is quite a bloodbath. And I mentioned earlier that I would be talking more about the ending, so let's get to that. Another reason why I didn't like the ending at all is because of how experimental it is. There are a lot of moments in this movie where it suddenly switches to an experimental style and I just couldn't find any meaning in that. Like with this one here, I get that it's meant to be, you know, Madame Blanc giving Susie her first dream or her first nightmare and that was a whole thing in the original and now we actually get to see the dream that she has. But this is just another one of those instances where it's like, this isn't a gap that I needed to be filled in. Like, what are we doing here? I couldn't really figure out what any of the imagery was contributing. Like, I don't have a connection here. Besides like a couple flashes of imagery from her Amish life. Like, okay. So do you see what I mean? I don't know. Because the other cinematography of this movie is so gorgeous. It looks so damn good. So that's why some of the experimental moments were just a little bit jarring and I didn't love them because the rest of the cinematography was so transportive. And I think that's because something about the ratio was really weird for me. I feel like this must be a choice inspired by ratios commonly used in the 1970s. I don't know, but something about this movie makes me feel like we're really zoomed in for some reason. Other praises for the remake would be the dancing. I mean, come on. The original only has a couple of dancing scenes that had no emphasis on the actual dance. It was all just about Susie and whatever she was going through. In the remake, we had full-on numbers of very sensual, meticulous choreography that was absolutely bewitching. Most bewitching of all was the scene I already discussed where Susie is breaking that poor other girl's bones. And let's talk more more about that. We talked about the vibrant blood of the original, so now it's time to talk about the gore of the remake. Pretty much every nasty shot of this movie was done practically with a slight blend of visual effects to complete the image. All the prosthetics they used were silicon, which is the most skin-like of any other prosthetic. But weirdly to me, they didn't read as practical. I feel like they bathed them in a little bit too much CGI correction for the practicality to read, but maybe that's just me. The only one that read super well, in my opinion, is of course going back to my favorite scene. They actually gave her a fake arm and a fake leg, and they use green screen technology to remove her actual limbs in post, which is just sick. Tilda Swinton also looks fantastic in her prosthetics. Apparently most people have no idea upon their first viewing that it's Tilda in there. I actually was able to tell about three fourths of the way into the movie. I was like, wait a minute. So the prosthetic work is dope, but I can't say that I'm a fan of all the looks that they went for. For example, the head witch, and admittedly, I don't really like the look of either of these witches. They're both a little bit too over the top and don't really make sense to 
me because what kind of a head witch like that would not have some kind of vitality potion to make herself look better? In the original, the makeup just isn't great. It's giving the vibes of the original Evil Dead a little bit. And in the remake, it's just giving me the ick and not in a fun way. The ick is much different than being creeped out or being scared. If you get it, you get it. You don't, you don't. You know what I just realized? That... <laughs> I was racking my brain the first time that I watched this movie, but um, this witch, when she gets killed, she looks like the like deflated teenager in those anti-weed ads. Like, this is your friend on pot. <laughs> and a lot about the ending of the remake in terms of style also just kind of went a little too far off the rails for me, but we talked about that. And I'm sure that there are several more style notes that I'm missing that we should talk about, but I'm gonna move on to the themes. Because truthfully, with everything about this movie, I could spend hours and and hours and hours talking about it. So drop it in the comment section, whatever I've missed so far. But what were we meant to learn or feel by watching these films? I don't feel like either of them are particularly thematic because both movies are very focused on style. And I could be mistaken, but I feel like both movies are really just up to the audience's interpretation. So this is kind of just what I read and what I got out of it. In the original, what I read is male fear of female power. Susie meets with that professor or whatever who tells her about these evil witches who use their magic to sacrifice people to acquire wealth. So you mean they're capitalists? Like, it just feels like male projection to me, like the fear of powerful women working together. And I don't mean that the film was trying to say that. Maybe it was because Daria is credited as a writer. But I'm actually psychoanalyzing Argento right here. And Luca, because he barely updated that theme, which is still pretty much equal evil and bad. The remake also felt kind of desperate to be saying something, and this is what Luca had to say about it. Suspiria is a movie about outcasts and the female as the ultimate outcast. And I wish that I could show you more about how he came to that conclusion, but either he never revisited that or they edited his explanation out, but it's not explained in that interview and I don't feel like it reads in the movie. The remake is very surface level, much like the original, but to me, the original original did not feel desperate to be interpreted. The remake feels like it's begging you to pick it apart and find meaning and fight with other people about what it means. So I think there's a big difference between the two movies because the original is like, yeah, I'm stylish as hell and that's about it. That's all you need to know. Where the remake is like, dissect me, love me, think about me for the rest of your life. And I don't fuck with that. <laughs> Giving men vibes just a little bit, but definitely not as badly. So I'm not really gonna elaborate much on what Luca was saying about how the themes of the remake are being an outcast. Because where? Donde? I get an inkling of that, of Susie coming in to save the day, to be the new good leader of this coven, but there was no character arc with that. She came and she belonged immediately. She had one audition and then rose to the top of the company. Like, I don't understand. So that is therefore gonna wrap up the theme portion of this video. I say that we do an overall comparison and try to decide which is the superior film. In terms of plot, it's hard to say because I do like the idea of the ending of the remake, but I don't like it in execution, so the plots are kind of tied. In terms of characters, again, I think it's a draw because I love our original Susie, but I love our remake Madame Blanc. With the style, it's also very hard to say. The color, production design, and score are some of the best that's ever been done, but the remake has that absolutely gorgeous cinematography and those dancing sequences cannot be beat. In terms of themes, you know, the original kept it very simple. It's up to you if you want to get anything deeper from it. And I'm not a fan of how badly the remake wants to be a film boy's next obsession, but basically neither movie is strong in theme. They're pretty much tied, so I'm gonna have to rely on my own opinion, my own entertainment value to make my final determination. And this is completely subjective, but my winner for today's video is the original Suspiria from 1977. Congrats to Dario Argento. Of course, let me know who your winner is down below. I have a feeling our audience will be very split on this. And I'm sorry for my bias spilling into a lot of my observations, but I feel like I was still pretty fair. As I said, whatever I missed, drop it in the comments below. I'm excited to talk about these movies with you guys, especially what your interpretation of the themes might be. But as always, a huge thank you to my lovely patrons for making this possible for me. I wouldn't be able to sustain the amount of work that I do for this channel without them. And if you'd like to join, then you can get bonus content for as low as $5 a month. And if you would subscribe and like this video, that would also mean a lot to me. That helps me immensely as well as boosting my engagement. But that's gonna do it. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope I catch you in the next one. Bye!